We're getting closer, closer to the cross, closer to the resurrection. As you probably know, we're now in the Garden of Gethsemane this week. Have you ever looked at that picture back there? Really, really looked at it? It's a gorgeous picture. I remember the first time I walked into the sanctuary and I walked forward and I turned around and it caught my eye and I just stood there. And I said, okay, Lord, maybe this is where I'm supposed to be. That same picture is in our den at home. It's positioned right in front of our couch and I sit and look at it hour after hour. Sometimes instead of watching TV, I turn and look at that picture. But this is the Sunday that we look at that and we remember. There are three things that I am hoping for today. Three things in this sermon that I hope you will take away with you today. I'll be exceedingly happy if you take one. I'll be really, really happy if you take two. And I'll be overjoyed if you take all three. There are three very important messages that come from this particular story, the Garden of Gethsemane, the place where Jesus goes to to find the strength, the resolve, the energy to walk toward the cross. We know he knew. That's a given. We know he knew how because he had to fulfill every scripture. He had to dot every I. He had to cross every T. If he hadn't, it would not have been real. He has to do it. So he knows this is going to happen, but we are now here. Have you ever anticipated something with dread and you finally get to that moment and it's overwhelming? That's what happens in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, the Garden of Gethsemane is like a beautiful park. It still is, it's still there. And it's surrounded so that it's not right off of a street. You have to go into it. And it's secluded. And it's used for prayer. And it's used for contemplation. But it was also used to make olive oil. In fact, they studied the olive trees of the garden itself. And they found out that the current olive trees that are in the garden are over a thousand some years old. They do believe that there are probably some trees that may date his time in the garden. It was called Gethsemane because it was called an olive press. That's what Gethsemane means. And so they made olive oil out of the, out of the trees in that garden. This is where Jesus had been given permission many times to go and pray. He had been given permission to go into this place when he needed solitude from the crowds. And he did. He did need solitude because as he became more popular, more and more people came to hear him. Often he would go up into the mountains thinking he was finding that place that would give him peace and quiet and turn around and the mobs would be behind him, such as the Sermon on the Mount. He didn't expect that to happen that day. He turned around and they were there waiting to hear him. Sometimes he even had to go to certain places off of the shore, leave his disciples in the boat so that he could pray. He needed to be able to talk to God just as we need to be able to talk to God. There is no relationship if we don't talk to God. There is none. If we cannot talk to Christ and God, we have nothing. Now, we're not talking fancy prayers here. We're not talking eloquent prayers that you so often hear. We're talking basic prayers like these. Help me, God. Dear God, I'm afraid. Dear God, walk in this room with me now. Dear God, don't leave me. Dear God, help me through this medical test. Dear God, when they put me out for surgery, be with me every minute. We're talking those kind of prayers. We're talking prayers, I love you, Lord, more than anything in the world. 
We're not talking eloquence here. We're talking real. And that's what he was doing with his father in the garden. Do you think it was a beautifully eloquent prayer? It was not. We know the words. If you can remove this cup from me, remove it. Do you know what the cup meant? See, we think of it as a cup that we drink out of. That's not the case. Cup in this time period meant wrath. Take this cup of wrath away from me. What is he dying for? He's dying for us. All the wrath and all the stuff that people would ever do is in that cup. Take the cup away. I don't want it. And then, okay, not my will but your will be done. Those are simple words that we all understand. Those are words that say it all. Not, dear Father in heaven, almighty, oh my goodness. I used to be in a group in college. I won't name the name of the group. It was one of those Christian groups on college campuses. And we would sit one night a week and have prayer time. I quit the group after about four weeks. I couldn't stand it. Because everybody had a chance to pray. And you know what they did? Everybody won up the next person. So if you were at the end of the line, your prayer had to be absolutely magnificent. Well, I was always at the end of the line in this room we sat in. And by the time it got to me, I was so afraid to pray, I couldn't open my mouth. Because the ones before me had gone on and on with eloquent words. And I just sat there and thought, Lord, if I'm really going to pray, I'm going to say, Hi, Lord. I'm scared. Hi, Lord, I need you. Those are the prayers that God hears. And those were the prayers that Jesus said that night in the garden. Now, there are three things, if we can take with us today, three important things. One is this. Jesus wasn't just betrayed by Judas that night. Let's be really honest. He was betrayed by everyone that night. They all left. They couldn't stay away with, awake with him. He asked them more than once, please watch for me, stay awake, don't fall asleep. Could they do it? No. They had just had their Passover meal. They had had food and wine, and they couldn't keep their eyes open. And when the Romans came to arrest him, they took off. Do we know where those disciples hid? No, but we know they ran in different directions. It wasn't just Judas. It was every one of them. He was betrayed by everyone that night. And when the Romans, and there were 200 some Romans, we believe, when they came to arrest him and walk him out of the garden, he was not walked out with anyone. He was alone. God was with him. Remember the angel who came to give him courage and strength? The angel was with him too. But the people left. He was betrayed by all his disciples, not just Judas with 30 pieces of silver. That's one thing we need to remember. He's alone. It's over. In this picture right here, they're asleep. They're in the background and they're sawing logs. They are, they are no help to him. The other thing we need to remember is that his anguish was beyond belief. I don't know how many of you have heard of the word um, panic attack. It's a common word we now hear. People have panic attacks. They're common. Not everyone has them, but if you've had one, you never forget it. I had one after my father died, a few months after my father died. I had no idea what was happening to me. I was clueless. It's one of the scariest things I have ever gone through in my life. I thought I was dying. I could hear my heart in my head. I couldn't breathe. So scary. Jesus was in such anguish that night 
that his robe turned another color. Did you know that? His robe went from being white to a pinkish color. There is actually a physiological thing that happened to Jesus that night, and we hear about it in the Bible, and it says he sweat blood. You know, when I was younger, I used to think that was just a literary thing. Oh, he was so scared he sweat blood. No, it's a physiological thing. When the body is so stressed and in such anguish that one can barely cope, there is at times, it's very rare, for the human body to bleed out of the sweat glands. This is how frightened he was. This is the man Jesus saying, I can't do it. I can't walk to that cross. I'm not going to make it. And it's not till the angel comes to give him support that he realizes, not my will, Lord, but yours. This is anguish and grief at its highest point. Do we realize that? When we look at this picture, what do we see? This is our Lord and our Savior, frightened beyond belief. He knows what he's going to see. He knows what he's going to face in the next 24 hours, and he's not ready. And he goes to the garden to get strength from the only place he can get it. Have you ever been there yourself? You go to someone to try to get strength and it's not there. You go to a friend, you go to a relative, and you just stand there and say, this isn't good enough. I'm still shaking inside. I'm still quivering. I still feel like I'm dying and I can't go on. And it's only Christ that can give that peace that allows you to sit down and say, okay, your will, not mine. Some of you know that feeling. Some of you know it well. Others do not. And we thank God for those who do not know it well. But that's what he was facing. There's the angel coming to give him strength. God never left Christ. He brought angel to help. So there are two things there. One is he was forsaken by everyone, and I mean everyone. The disciples took off. They hid behind trees. They ran out of the garden. They were nowhere to be seen. Jesus was in a state of stress that was beyond fathomable. Take the highest level of stress you have ever had, and that is probably not as close to what he was. He took in that cup, that cup of wrath, everything we have ever done, everything we will ever do, that cup was filled and brimming over. He took it to the cross with him. He felt the pain of every man and every woman, and only that angel gave him a bit of a reprieve for the hours ahead. Have you looked at that picture? Look at it again. They all left him. He is beyond. He's beyond anguish. He's shaking. He's bleeding. And then wouldn't you know, the final one, the final one, the disciples are upset when they see the Romans and the high authorities coming to arrest Jesus. For you see the way it worked. Judas comes out and he kisses Jesus. And there's the betrayal. Not the complete betrayal. It's going to happen in a few minutes when the disciples flee. But he kisses him. Now the high authorities and the Romans know this is him. And when they ask the question, he acknowledges that he is who he is. Do you catch that part in the scripture? They move back. The Roman authorities, the Romans move back. The people in high positions, Sadducees, Pharisees, move back out of fear. Do you remember that part? Why? 
because for that moment, in that moment, they see him. They see who he is. And they now realize they're about ready to arrest the king of kings. And they're overwhelmed. And in that moment, they see who he is because he lets them see who he is. He had the ability, we hear it in scripture, to have moved them all back over a mountain. He had the ability to change everything at that moment. When they pulled back and were in awe and saw the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Savior, he had a chance to stop it all, but he didn't. Those are the three messages from this story. It's jam-packed. And how does it have to do with us? Have we ever betrayed him? Have we ever run? When the going got tough and we didn't want somebody to know we were a Christian, did we ever back out? I know I did. When I was in high school a few times, I didn't want people to know that. That wouldn't make me cool. Oh, yeah, you guys go ahead and do your prayer thing. I'll see you later. But it can be done in much worse ways. And that night it was done in the worst of all. In his deepest time of need, they all take off. Have you ever done that? Have you ever decided you don't need him? Most of us have. Most of us have betrayed him at some time. Have you ever known the anguish that he felt? Probably not, because you haven't taken the wrath on of every human being that's ever lived. But you do know what it is to be afraid. You do know what it is to be in anguish and frightened that the next day might not be there for you. Or the test results might be too much for you to handle. If you've been there, you understand what he went through. And the other part is this. Imagine what it must have been like for those Roman soldiers to see him. The cover is off and they can see who he really is. Jesus Christ, Lord of Lord, Savior of all, and they're going to take him and walk him out of the Garden of Gethsemane over the Kidron Valley River where all of the blood is coming down from the temple. Yes, that's where they walked him over. Walked him over a bridge, and the river was filled with blood. Do we think he didn't know that? Of course. And he looked down at that river knowing that that would be him soon, the sacrifice. I told you these weeks would be tough. I told you they wouldn't be pretty. Next week is even worse. And then, thank goodness, we turn the corner and we begin looking forward to the resurrection. These are the toughest weeks of the years for us. These are our high holy days. In the Jewish world, it's Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. This is ours. But it's not cookie-coated here or candy-coated. It's real. He was miserable, betrayed, anxious. Do you realize what happened? He showed who he was to those people for a brief few seconds. The world could have changed at that moment. He had the ability to change the course of all history, and he chose not to. He followed the will of his father. Where are we then as his children? We too are asked to follow the will of the father. We too are asked to walk to the cross. That's what Christianity is really about. It's not a club we join. It's a walk. It's a walk that says, I love you enough to give my whole life to you. I love you enough to walk to the cross and live the life you've asked me to live. That's what it's about. It's also about a church, this church, that must take a direction that walks to the cross too. It means that we ask God for everything. It's not a group of people making a decision on consistory nights. No, it's a group of people who follow God first and then make decisions. It's a group of people who seek his will over everything else. 
It's a group of people who don't stare at their navels, but look out into the world, for that is where God is. And God's also in here, where we take care of each other and love each other through the toughest of times. There's the message. It's a rough one. Next week is rougher. Next week is rougher because it's the cross next week. You ready? Are you ready? You know, I could be a minister who tells the pretty side of all this, but I wouldn't be doing justice to his name, to his life, and I wouldn't be living up to the glory that he deserves. Because he did this week for me, and he did it for you. He did it so you never have to be alone. He did it so that you can have the peace beyond understanding. He did it so that when it's the very worst and you're at the bottom of life, his hand comes down and pulls you up. He did it as a man so he could understand us. Can you imagine if he was a God trying to pray? At this moment, he's a man. Would he ever understand the pain? Because there's not a day when we don't hurt in some way or form. You know, I said a few weeks ago, um, Christians lie every day. Did you know that? You heard that? We lie every day. Sometimes two times, sometimes three times. Depends on how many people we meet. When do we lie? When someone says this to us. Hi, how you doing? Fine. Hey, how you doing? Fine. Oh, good. I'm doing great. Lies. It's the truth. Because I know so many of you and what you're going through. They aren't all good days. They aren't. They're rough. You hurt. You're sick. All kinds of things happen. Life is tough. That's why he went to the cross so that we could have a life with him guiding us, holding us up, loving us through, and most of all, assuring us that this isn't all there is, that we have a life eternal in heaven. And when we say goodbye to someone we love, we have the promise that we're going to see them again in all glory. I end this sermon with just this little story. Walked into a room the other day. This happens a lot, but it was beautiful how it happened. And the woman is dying, and the family's around the dying woman. And, and I said, how's everyone doing right now? And this was the answer I got. Well, we were doing okay, but now we're doing a lot better. And I said, what happened? And they said, Daddy came to see Mom. I said, okay. I said, this is her husband? Yes. Dad came to see Mom and said he's ready to take her home when she's ready. I said to the woman who's dying, did your husband come to see you? And she said this, oh, yes, honey. He came to see me and so did Jesus. And pretty soon we're going on a journey. We won't be here much longer. And I said, felt pretty good. And she said, I'm going to be with my husband again. And I'm going to be with my Lord and Savior. That's it. That's the promise. You don't have to be afraid. What a gift. And he did it all for us. Let us pray. Dearest Lord, you did it for us. The least we can do is walk through these weeks with you. They're not pretty. They're not easy to hear about. But you did them so that you could give us life. Let us thank you and give you all glory. Prepare us for the next week when we truly try to walk to the cross with you. Lord, keep us from betraying you. Keep us from running from you. 
let us stay as close as we can to you during this very, very rough time when you came so that life could be eternal. In your name we pray. Amen.